What's up, Calvary family? I want to welcome you to the sixth week of our eight-week series that we have called Enemies of the Heart. I want to welcome everybody in person, and I want to welcome everybody online. If you would, take one of your hands, set it on your heart, and I want you to say it out loud with all you got today. I don't care where you are. Say it out loud like you believe it. Say, eyes to see, ears to hear. A heart to receive, a mouth to confess, all the good things Christ has already provided for me. Now, if you're ready for God's word, clap your hands and just give him the best praise you've given him all day long. It is so good to see you today, lower floor, upper tier. I am so glad to be with you in person, glad to have those of you with us online and I look forward to seeing you in person real soon. Today we're going to be talking about a pretty big enemy of the heart. This one is no joke, y'all. It's the enemy called bitterness. And I don't care who you are, where you come from, or what you have walked through. We have all had to deal with this enemy called bitterness. In Acts 28, the Apostle Paul was on his way to Rome. It's a fascinating story. I would encourage you to read it on your own. But he had just survived a shipwreck that stranded him along with other passengers on an island called Malta. And the natives welcomed them and built a fire to warm them. And Paul was reaching down, the Bible says, to place some firewood on the fire. Are you ready for this? When a viper slithered out of the wood pile and fastened itself on his hand. First, think about it, nearly killed at sea, now bitten by a deadly snake. Just when he thinks he's out of dangerous waters, snakes come out of the woodwork. It went from bad to worse. Some of you say that's how this year has felt. Did he blame the natives for not snake proofing the campsite? Nope. Watch what he did. The Bible says, watch, he shook it off into the fire. He shook it off into the fire. I don't want to bother anybody, but let's practice Shake it off. Come on, somebody. Shake it off. I like some you did with both hands. You shook it off. Come on. He shook it off into the fire. And I say that because on our journey through life, watch this, we're going to receive some snake bites. And I'm not necessarily talking today about physical snake bites from rattlesnakes or vipers. Watch. I'm talking today about heart snake bites. And the Bible refers to Satan, think about this, as a serpent. And he wants to attach himself to our soul, our heart, our mind, so that he can inject his poisonous venom. And when the enemy bites, we can do one of two things, church. We can either let him hang on, watch, or we can shake it off. And if we don't shake off the serpent, the snake bite, it'll continue to pump poison into our heart. And I realize that's where many of us are right now. We have poisoned hearts. And what have we been learning lately? Our heart is literally like fertile soil. That's what Jesus said. The spiritual womb where God's word, right, the seed takes root And that's why I think the Bible says we've got to cultivate, we've got to protect the soil of our heart. And if we aren't careful, if we allow the enemy access into our heart, we can easily become bitter. That's why I think the Bible says stuff like this, above everything else, you better learn how to guard your heart. Because out of your heart spring the issues of your life. The heart is a big deal. And bitterness, I'm telling you, It doesn't belong in our heart. We need healing 
You can't afford to get bitter. Listen to me, church. You cannot afford to get bitter right now. And a bitter heart is incredibly destructive. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 12 that bitterness will spring up. And watch this. It'll cause trouble not only in your own life, but it'll defile many others in its path. Bitterness will cause untold trouble in our life. Church, unchecked bitterness has the capacity to wreak havoc on our health, on our mind, on our emotions, on our relationships, on our friendships, on our finances. Listen, bitterness can cause a world of trouble that will defile not only you, but others around you. And a root of bitterness that began with one person has ruined whole families, has ruined friendships, has ruined companies, has ruined churches. If you allow the enemy called bitterness into your heart, you'll not only create trouble for yourself, but those around you just oozes out on everybody else. When I launched this series, I started talking about perspective. This is important because perspective is created, remember I said, when our eyes and our heart exchange information. I said that although we see with our eyes, we perceive with our heart. So perspective is really the way Our heart interprets what we see. I said it like this. We don't see things as they are. We actually see things as we are. And when we allow attitudes into our heart, the fact of the matter is it colors everything we see. If y'all are getting this, somebody say yes. And when our heart becomes poisoned, the eyes start looking at others differently. And when our heart becomes bitter, we view others around us in venomous ways. That's why it's so vital that we learn how to forgive those who have hurt us. And that's why today, before we walk out of this place, we're going to gather around the Lord's table and we're going to receive communion together. Watch this. And we're going to be reminded of how forgiven we truly are in Christ Jesus. You know, I thought about Peter who asked Jesus, and I love this. He comes to Jesus and he says this. In Matthew 18, he says, Lord, when someone has offended me, how many times should I forgive him? Should it be once? Should it be twice? How about seven times? And I'm sure when Peter said this to Jesus, I'm sure he had someone specific in mind. Jesus, I got a question for you. And I'm sure he's thinking about somebody that really made him mad. I mean, Peter was kind of a hothead anyway, and I'm sure he had had it with, you know, uh, uh, whoever he was referring to. He didn't say who it was, but he said, Jesus, if I got to forgive somebody, are y'all getting this? And I'm sure he had kept track of the offense, and he'd reached his limit uh, when it, you know, comes to extending forgiveness. And so he says, how many times should I forgive Jesus? One, two, how about seven? I don't know, that's it. But Jesus answered, and look what he said in verse 22. He said, Peter, you gotta forgive not seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, he's saying this every time. When the snake bites, Peter, you gotta shake it off every time. And Jesus knew that forgiveness was not optional. It was essential And he said to keep extending mercy to those who have hurt us. And every day, I'm telling you, will bring new offenses. Requiring what? New forgiveness. Every time we're offended, we've got to forgive. No exceptions, but why? Why? We've got to talk about it today, and I'll get there. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have someone they have to forgive. Well, we love talking about forgiveness until we've really been offended. And forgiveness doesn't operate only when we feel good. Did you know that it is an act of our will when we don't even feel like doing it? Forgiveness isn't a one-time event. It is an ongoing process because there will always be new opportunities in your life to extend forgiveness. And let me tell you, I don't think I've ever felt, I'm going to be honest with you today and tell you, I don't think I've ever felt one time, I've never felt like forgiving. I honestly don't recall one time I went into a situation feeling like forgiving. 
But forgiveness is like everything else we do, believer. Watch this. We do it by faith, not by feeling. And God doesn't even tell us, and I want to make this clear today when I talk about it, but God doesn't tell us to forgive and forget. You'll hear people say, well, you better forgive and forget because that's what God does. No, that's not what he does, and I've taught on that before. But he doesn't say you forgive and forget because there are some events that happen in life that we will never forget, but they can be so covered by the grace of God as we learn to live out forgiveness that the pain is eventually erased. And I think that is one of the greatest aspects of God's grace. Lift your hands. In the name of Jesus, I speak over every broken heart today, every wounded heart today. I speak grace, grace in Jesus' name. I speak grace so that the pain is eventually erased. And if you believe and receive it, clap your hands and give God praise like you do. Hallelujah. I receive it. I'm going to quickly add this too. Forgiveness isn't an abdication of justice. Instead, forgiveness involves deferring justice to God. And we choose to forgive those who've wronged us. And how God chooses to deal with those who've wronged us, that's his concern. And by leaving the business of justice in the hands of God. Watch, we are finally free to attend to our business, and our business is what? The business of forgiveness. We've been forgiven, and so we can freely forgive. And the fact is we forgive, watch this, we forgive for our own good. You thought you were forgiving for the other person. You were actually forgiving for your own good. Forgiveness prevents the enemy of bitterness from poisoning our heart. And if we don't forgive, we allow the snake to inject its venom into our heart. And just as the serpent lied, lied, remember in the book of beginning, lied to Adam, lied to Eve. He'll attempt to lie to us as well. And, 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 and he speaks to our heart, our mind, trying to prevent us from forgiving others, holding us in bondage, keeping us captive and, and poisoning our heart with bitterness. And a poisoned heart is a bitter heart, but the enemy of, of bitterness, you need to understand, uh, doesn't instantly happen. I want to talk about some stages, four stages, stage four, four stages, kind of like cancer. Stage four means it's affected everything else. Bitterness is dangerous. If you're taking notes on that app, wherever you are, online, in person, watch this, write it down. Get it down. Don't miss this. Bitterness is a process. It takes place in stages. What are those stages? Stage one is this. Watch offense. And I know what I'm dealing with today. It's, it feels tight, but watch. Sometimes it's got to get tight before it gets right. Offense. Bitterness begins as a seed. It hits the soil of your heart. Seed of offense. And when you're offended, a negative seed will hit your heart. Someone offends you. Someone betrays you. A colleague makes a devastating comment behind your back. A family member wrongfully judges you and it hurts. It hurts deeply. And the enemy plants this thought into your mind in that moment. I am so offended by what he did to me, by what she did to me. Watch, offense, did you know it can be real or it can be imagined? And while some people intentionally, there are some folks who intentionally set out to hurt you, but did you know there are some people who didn't mean to? And although their action may be innocent, we get offended through our imagination, through our assumption, whatever. That's why in recent days I've been dealing so much with imagination. When someone hurts our feelings, the enemy tempts us by becoming resentful. Every bitter person had his start, had her start through what? Being offended by someone. Chose to be offended. Chose to be offended. As I look back on now nearly 27 years of full-time ministry, I am aware that bitterness had to, ha has really destroyed more Christians' lives than almost anything. 
And I'm personally aware of countless number of people who started on their journey with Jesus and have now abandoned it because they chose to be offended. They chose to be offended. And most of them could describe a situation when they were hurt, when they felt abandoned, when they felt betrayed, when they were let down, when they were disappointed by other people. You know what's interesting? Did you know that that word offense, watch, it's the Greek word scandalon, and a scandalon is the stick, the wooden stick on a trap where you place the bait that will lure in the prey. It's literally the wooden stumbling block of the trap. That is a thought. Doesn't that bring new meaning right there when you piously say something like this? I am so offended. When you say you are so offended, you are actually admitting you took the bait. You stepped into the enemy's trap, the trap that he set for you. I'm so offended. You're saying, I took the bait. And Jesus taught that it is inevitable that off Offenses will come our way. We might as well face it. Let me tell you something. In life, we are going to have opportunity all the time to be offended. And it's one of the guarantees in life. I can guarantee you a few things. I can guarantee death. I can guarantee taxes. And I can guarantee offenses. And people will let us down. And this is something we can definitely count on. But church, please hear me today. You have a choice. You don't have to take the bait. And I'm watching people right now take the bait. We must act immediately during that that offense stage to forgive. Let me tell you, offense is hurt. I get it. Some of you say it hurts deeply, but we have a choice. You are not a victim. You are not a loser. You are not a martyr. You are not a sitting target. You have a choice. You can acknowledge the pain. You can tend to your wound. You can forgive. You can allow Jesus to heal your heart. You can shake, shake it off. Move your hand like you're shaking it off. You can shake it off. You can maintain your freedom. You can maintain your peace. You can maintain your joy. And if you believe it, clap your hands and give God praise. I'm keeping my freedom keeping my peace keeping my joy but watch this if we don't deal with it this way it'll lead to another stage watch this the next stage stage two is anger and if we hold on to the offense rather than shake it off and a lot of people are right here that hurt turns into anger and the enemy plants another thought right here and says, well, I'm still mad at what he did to me, at what she did to me. And anger comes, I get it, in all shapes and all sizes, and things don't go our way. So what do we do? We get angry. Our kids lie to us, and we get angry. Our spouse violates trust, and what do we do? We get angry. Somebody close to you hurts you, and you get angry. Listen, Ephesians 4 says, if you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Shake it off. Get over it quickly. In other words, don't let that anger fester. See, some of you right now, I'm telling you, we live in an angry world and it's festering. And I can't tell you how many times early on in my marriage I can talk about it today because Pastor Kim isn't here, so I think I'll talk about it. <laughs> Why are y'all laughing? Come on. Pray for me, everybody. Pray for me. I can't tell you how many times early on in our marriage my pride nursed a grudge and I thought about it even when Kim attempted to apologize I wanted her to pay a little longer and I'd hold on to that if that offense and instead of shaking that offense off and and accepting an apology I'd sit up and sometimes I'd sit up all night and I'd I I tell you I, I I'd be so angry I would stay up and I would just nurse that grudge. And then I'd end up even more mad when I would walk into the bedroom expecting to see Kim awake, tossing and turning like me. Instead, she's asleep like a baby. 
And then I walk out and I'm more mad that she's asleep. <laughs> Are y'all getting this? Is this just me? And, and, I, and I should have just dealt with it right then and there so we could have, or maybe just me, I could have got a good night's sleep. Instead, my anger degenerated deeper into resentment. Watch this, and this is where you got to be careful because anger, watch this, it leads to another stage. Don't miss this. Watch, and it's called unforgiveness. And unforgiveness is what? Unforgiveness is actually prolonged anger. It's prolonged resentment, and it drains the love out of our heart so that we view others. See, watch, now you're viewing others with scorn, and, and we don't like... That word, and we don't even know that word, scorn, but it simply means what? Hatred. And the enemy plants another thought in our mind. I just can't forgive him. I cannot forgive her right now. And, and we've all heard about hate crimes that call me naive, but I, I tell you, I've never once heard of any crime called a love crime. And I want you to hear this. Refusing to forgive is a hate crime. Let's call unforgiveness what it is. It's hatred. And we don't like to think of our unforgiveness as hatred because we want to justify our ungodly attitudes, right? These enemies that we've allowed to break into our heart. We want to give a voice to our hurt and betrayal. We secretly desire some of us. I know we sit here and look good and we lift our hands and we look like we got it together, but some of us, let me tell you, we want to see the people who have hurt us punished and then we want to wash our hands of the guilt like Pompous Pontius Pilate. Someone said this, I think it was Sigmund Freud, he once said, we must forgive our enemies, but not before they have been hanged. Yeah. Amen. Amen. When we don't forgive, my point is this, we want justice administered to our enemies instead of mercy. How many of you today are thankful for God's mercy? I'm telling you today, I am so thankful for mercy. You know what grace is, right? Grace is simply receiving what we don't deserve. You know what mercy is? Not receiving what we do deserve. And one of the most miserable women I've ever met, she was a church woman. She's not here today. Don't worry. <laughs> don't look around. Don't look around. I saw somebody back there say, is he talking about you? This church woman, she's one of the most miserable women I've ever met. Did you know that she kept a mental list of people she'd never forgiven? And she spent her entire life guarding that list in her heart of people who wronged her. And that list was full of all these real and imagined offenses. And did you know it robbed her in her life of relationships and happiness and love? I think there's a reason why the Bible says this. Love keeps no record of wrong. And if we allow the venom of unforgiveness into our heart, let me tell you, it's going to proceed into this final stage. Don't miss this. And the final stage is bitterness. And that's what we're dealing with today. And I know it's quiet, but it's all right. God, deal with the deep places in our heart. The enemy plants this thought, I can't stand him. I can't stand her. I'll never forgive him. I'll never forgive her. And bitterness is an enemy of the heart, which is the result of an unhealed wound. And at this stage, our heart has been injected with poisonous venom, causing us to view others now with hostility, looking at others with, with hatred. Several years ago, there was a, a lady who passed away and family members were cleaning out her house and they found a scrapbook that was hidden away. And did you know the scrapbook was filled with obituaries from the newspaper that were cut out and many of them were people that she detested. And as bizarre as it sounds, she kept a scrapbook of her dead enemies. This woman had clippings of her, of her despised foes in this morbid memory book. And apparently, she gained some kind of strange satisfaction by thinking that they could no longer torment her. But the reality was, each one of those enemies still had a grip on her heart. And if we don't forgive our enemies, whether they're still in our lives or not, they will continue to 
haunt us through our hurtful memories of them. Some of you are still dealing with ghosts of your past. Someone said, I'll never let anyone walk through my mind with their dirty feet. And can I tell you something? Sadly, many of you have allowed people to walk through your mind with their dirty feet. And you keep replaying that stuff over and over and over again. And now you're holding a grudge against them. And I'm telling you, few people ever escape when they reach stage four. I'm talking about bitterness. When they reach this place, they stay offended. They stay angry. They remain trapped inside a prison cell that they created, and I'm telling you, the enemy of bitterness is one of the most powerful enemies of the heart, and it creates strongholds that take over a person's heart, just like cancer. Think about that stage four cancer. What does that mean? It means that it is spread to other parts of your body, and bitterness, same way when it gets to stage four, it just spreads and affects every area of your being, but how many of you want to overcome bitterness? Say yes right now. I declare over you right now in the name of Jesus, you reign in life. Life does not reign over you. I declare in the name of Jesus, you are an overcomer, which means you will overcome it. I declare you're going to walk in freedom in Jesus' name. If you believe it, clap your hands and give God praise. You're going to beat that enemy of bitterness. I declare your heart healed in Jesus' name. Deep heart wounds healed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, take your hand and set it right here on your heart. In the name of Jesus, I speak healing over your heart now. In Jesus' name, I speak healing over your heart now. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, even now, let him touch your heart right now. If I were to give you some steps, I'd, sim I'd simply say this, the first one being this, you gotta shake it off. I'm, I'm telling you, you gotta shake that thing off. You shake it off. Bitter people are filled with deadly poison because they, they, they've had a snake attached for so long and, and their hearts are full of venom because they don't shake it off when the snake first struck. And as long as the snake is still attached, it's just injecting venom injecting venom. The longer you hold on, the more poison is going to fill your heart. The thing I would say is this. The second thing. I told you we're going to take communion together. You got to let go of the offenses. Look at me. I read an interesting story how they used to catch monkeys in, in the jungle. You know what they would do? They would set up a trap, and, and they were so smart, they knew the monkeys were going to go inside the trap. So they would create a trap, and, and watch. They'd set the bait inside the food or the shiny object or whatever. And the monkey knew, I'm not going inside, but watch. That monkey would reach through the cage, grab hold of the bait, watch this, and then try to bring its hand out. But look. Because of a balled up fist holding on to the bait, the monkey could not get its hand out the cage. Watch. And the hunter knew that. And the monkey would scream and holler and kick, but just keep holding on. Stay trapped in bondage because it refused to let go of the bait. If you got ears to hear, may you hear what the Spirit of God is saying right now. Some of you listen to me. You're trapped, and the Spirit says, let go. Remember that Greek word, offense, right? The part of the trap where the bait sits to lure you. Have you grabbed on to the bait? The enemy set a trap using offense as a bait. You grabbed hold. If you grab onto the offense, you become a prisoner as long as you hold on. And I'm telling you right now, and I'm ministering to you right here in person and those of you online, that many people are prisoners right now in the enemy's trap simply because they refuse to let go. Go of those offenses. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 1, so we let go of every wound that has pierced us. And sin that so easily 
we fall into, then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination. Can I tell you right now, you can't not run the race of a lifetime with offense wounds. And I want to close today with this third reality before we receive communion together. And this is a big one, and I sense the Spirit of God right now. And I'm just declaring healing, deep heart healing today. I, man, I feel this thing. But be an instant forgiver. Now let me talk to you. Boy, hear my voice today. May the Spirit of God minister to your heart today wherever you are. Bitter people need to get the venom out. They got to get it out of their spiritual bloodstream. And love is the anti-venom of hatred and forgiveness is the serum of the, the poison of bitterness. Let me, let me use an example. If, if, if anyone had the right to be offended, if anybody had the right to be bitter and angry, I thought about this Old Testament example. Now I'm going somewhere. You better stay with me. His name was Joseph. And Joseph knew what it was like to be hurt, to be betrayed, to be wounded by the people closest to him. And Genesis 37, just read it on your own sometime, but it tells us the story that he was the favored son and, and everyone knew it. And jealousy consumed his brothers and they saw all the goodness that his father had on him. And to make things worse, you know, Joseph had some dreams about some things in his life, some good things, and they got so jealous that it enraged his brothers, and they became angry, and they planned to kill him, and they threw him in a pit, and they were going to say that an animal devoured him, and then they have an opportunity to sell him into slavery. If anybody had a right to feel bitter, to feel angry and betrayed, it was Joseph. Think about it. He'd been stripped, thrown into a pit, left to die, then removed sold into slavery all by his very own brothers. Now, fast forward. Many, many years. Fast forward. Are you all with me? Say yes. After slavery, after imprisonment, he's still there. See, some of you don't realize the most powerful thing about you is that you're still here. He ends up becoming ruler over Egypt. Watch this. What the enemy meant for evil. God turned it around for his good. Watch. And here was Joseph's chance. Don't miss this. In the middle of a famine, Joseph's brothers come to Egypt. He's now ruler of Egypt, and they come to Egypt. They're looking for food, and here was Joseph's chance. Now, I can get even. Here's his chance. They're going to grovel. I'm going to make them starve. I'm going to humiliate them in front of the entire nation. Watch. Yet Joseph did none of these things. His love was the antivenom for hatred his forgiveness was the serum for the poison of bitterness and instead of punishing them for their evil deeds look at this I'm going somewhere Joseph extended grace upon grace upon grace mercy upon mercy upon mercy watch this he didn't want them to feel guilty for sending him to Egypt but instead assured them it was God's plan and look at look at his response in Genesis 45 verse 5 and now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life and I believe his response speaks volume of the health of his heart and I believe he forgave his brothers years and years prior to that day and Joseph was an instant forgiver he could have allowed unforgiveness to fester in a pit he could have allowed unforgiveness to fester while he was in slavery he could have allowed unforgiveness to fester while he was in prison and turn into crazy deep bitterness but he chose to forgive his offense and he beat the enemy 
enemy of bitterness. Now watch this. There's a reason, New Covenant believer, why the Bible says this. Close your eyes and listen to what Paul writes. Ephesians 4. Get rid of all bitterness. Watch. Rage and anger and harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind, tenderhearted. Don't miss this. Forgiving one another. Don't miss it. Just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Watch. Before the cross, we forgive to be forgiven. Don't miss this. After the cross, we forgive because we've already been forgiven. Watch. Do you want to know why so many people have a hard time forgiving? Watch. Because they don't know how forgiven they truly are. And some of you, I'm telling you, don't you miss this truth. Because when we read our Bibles, do you know what we do most of the time? We try to put ourselves in the story. Now let me circle back around and say this. I'm sorry, you're not Joseph. You're not Joseph in the story. He's an Old Testament picture of Christ. Why do I say that? Watch, because on your own, you could never do what Joseph did. Matter of fact, if it was me, I'd kill every one of my brothers. When they showed up and I'm ruling, I'd look at my guys and go. You're not Joseph. It's a type of Christ. You could never do that. If you could, you wouldn't need Jesus. And how many of you need Jesus? As new covenant believer on the finished side of the cross, watch, we forgive because we've already been forgiven. And if we've truly received God's forgiveness, that's what will flow from our hearts. And maybe you are squaring up right now against the enemy of bitterness. You have been betrayed and it hurts deeply. Your heart has been hurt today. The Lord is right here. And I sense the Spirit of God saying this. Lift up your hands right now. Psalm 34 verse 18. What a promise. May you hear it now. May you hear it now. May you hear it now. The Lord is close to all whose hearts have been crushed by pain and he is always ready 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 to restore he is always ready he is always ready he is always ready to restore lift up those hands there's a release right now of the restoration of God I declare it over your hearts now I declare Clear it over your hearts now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lift up those hands and just receive the free forgiveness of God over you. Some of you say, I've offended, but in Jesus' name, I declare healing over your heart. And with hands lifted, receive his free forgiveness now. Don't ask for anything, but for the next 30 seconds, thank him that you have been forgiven freely. You've been forgiven fully, and you've been forgiven finally. Lift those hands and thank him right now all over this place. I speak healing in the name of Jesus. I speak healing of your heart in the name of Jesus. I 
see the Lord's hand right now taking your heart in his hand. I see him taking healing oils and healing your wounded heart. I see him massaging out those rough, hard places. Let those hands receive healing right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I speak healing in Jesus' name. Let those hands just receive. Just receive, just receive. Those of you whose heart's been grieved. Those of you that's been living in isolation. Those of you that have refused to deal with this enemy. Say, where's my joy? Where's my peace? Where's my freedom? Some of you hadn't been enjoying everything God surrounded you. Estranged from family members. Estranged from friendships. But there's a healing of your heart. Woo. Lift those hands, receive a healing right now in your heart. Just want you to focus on his love for you. Don't curse it. Don't nurse it. <laughs> Don't rehearse it. Disperse it and reverse it. <laughs> I declare in the name of Jesus, when you choose to forgive, you disperse the negative effects of bitterness and reverse the curse associated with it. In the name of Jesus, I declare you are an overcomer and you're coming over it. Coming over it. In the name of Jesus, don't even try to forgive him. Right now, just focus on his forgiveness extended to you. You'll never be able to do it on your own. But when you let him do it in and through you, when you let him do it in and through you, there's just a flow. There's just a flow. There's just a flow. There's just a flow. I see it breaking open in you now. See it breaking open in you now. Woo. See it breaking open in you now. Lift those hands. There's a release of joy right now. In release of peace on the inside of you right now. In the name of Jesus, bitterness that's made places hard, being broken up right now. Lift up your hands. There's a release of freedom right now in the name of Jesus. For the next 30 seconds, lift up your hands and just receive right now in Jesus' name. Everybody.